Chapter 5. Therefore, anytime you see a therefore, that usually means they're summing stuff up. Yes. Is my wife here yet? Yes, she must be here by now. Okay. Therefore, I exalt and exhort the elders amongst you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is yet to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God amongst you, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for your personal sordid gain, but instead with eagerness. Do not lord it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is in fact opposed to the proud, but yet gives grace always to the humble. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and let him exalt you at the proper time. Cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Be sober of spirit and always on the alert for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking always to devour someone. Instead resist him, firm in your faith. Know that the same experience of suffering is being accomplished by your brethren who are in all the world. And that even after you've suffered for a little, the grace of God who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Therefore to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's technically the end of his letter. Then he writes a little postscript. Through Sylvanius, our faithful brother, uh, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand therefore firm in it. For she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, as does my son Mark. Greet therefore one another with the holy kiss of love, and peace be to all of you who are in Christ. What do you think of that? Closing remarks and inclusion. Hmm? Closing remarks and inclusion. Well, he is. And, you know, the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Uh, that's, if I were to characterize this chapter, that's what I would call it. Christianity when the rubber hits the road. Um, some of the best sermons you'll ever hear is the person you observe sitting next to you, you know, <laughs> and that's especially for children. I, I tell parents all the time, I said, you know, some of the best sermons your kids will ever hear is to see mom and dad sitting in church together. Um, it's what they do, what's important to them, not what they say. Oh, I believe in God. I believe this. I believe that. But then never go and never get involved, never do anything, never help anybody, never serve in, in any way. But, you know, they're, ah, you got to believe in God. Well, eventually kids are going to see that and say, Dad, come on. You know, you don't go, you don't get involved, you don't do this, you don't do that. They've asked you to do stuff, and you don't. You always have a reason not to. So what's the kid going to say? You're going to grow up just like them. I got news for you. It's a scientific fact proven over hundreds of millions of years that, you know, an abuser grows up to be... I mean, an abused child grows up to be an abuser, you know, a nasty this grows up to be a nasty that. And your you parents smoking their brains out, well, the kids are going to eventually end up smoking their brains out. And, and we pass that stuff on. And but, you know, the spirit of can be in even if the parents are not that close. Well, God won't make you do anything. I mean, he makes that quite plain. He'll reveal himself, yeah. but the decision is yours. Amen. And there's no better uh, 
sermon that will ever be preached than a good example. Everybody in this room can probably think of somebody that they truly admire. Question, why do you admire that person? Did they sit down with you and say, now listen, I'm really great and you need to admire me forever? I believe that. Oh, shut up. <laughs> but see, people don't do that. Why do we admire them? Because of what they've done, right? Who they are, who they are to us, how they've touched us personally, how they've made our lives either better or easier or whatever. And when we say to ourselves, hey, write down five people that you admire, we could usually, usually we could do that, most of us. Uh, if I said, give me the five MVPs of the National League for the last five years, most of you probably say, I don't know who that is. You're right, even though they're the game, they're the glory and the great guys that go, yeah, and get $50 million a year, you don't remember them. But it, you remember that old lady that used to live next door to you, who always made you pies or something, brought them over and cared for you and asked about you and, you know, helped you out when you were sick. You remember that, don't you? Why? Why do you admire her? Because she was a good example, maybe not, not just of Christianity, but of life in general. The greatest sermon on love starts where? I think at home. If you can't admire and respect the people in your own household in terms of love, and I'm defining love as the character of God. Did you see the, the bishop's uh, homily on love? I didn't. Uh, I thought it was amazing. The character of God. You're talking about that wedding thing or whatever? Yeah, I don't watch that nonsense. Oh, yeah? The character of God. The homily on love was wonderful. <laughs> Ah, oh, now I don't know where I was going with this. Um, oh, in terms of humble submission. There's a lot to be said for Jesus when he said, if you want to be first, the best, the most admired, put yourself in the last place. You know, put yourself... In the, in the position of servitude, put yourself where you become everybody else's blessing. The go-to guy, so to speak. If you do this, you will be the best number one apostle there is. Now, a lot of guys might say, what are you, crazy? I mean, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, you know. I need to be out there just self-promoting, telling everybody how wonderful I am. Well, again, it's like, tell me the top five American League MVPs for the last five years. Who can do that? Anybody in this room? Brady plays football. I'm talking baseball, American League. <laughs> Not the American football league. Who was on the list now? Huh? Who was on the list now? The last five years, who, are, who were the Do chosen? Do I know? No, I don't know. I don't care. But if you ask me to name five people that I admire in my life, I could do that easily. Very easily. Uh, why? Did they do anything outstanding? Well, they were just wonderful people. And that didn't happen overnight. That did, you know, it took a long time and a lot of effort and a lot of service and a lot of living as a good Christian example for me to come to the point where I said, man, I wish I was like that. And that's what happens. And that's what Paul or Peter is saying in this last chapter. Forget all the teaching. Well, don't forget all the teaching, but all the theology on one side. And this theology has got to make that jump into life and behavior 
And it's got to be sustained throughout your life until you accomplish becoming Christ-like. The Bible says becoming Christ-like, but becoming this incredible example where everybody says, wow. Uh, throughout history, Jesus' life literally changed the course of history with his coming and his appearance. Changed it for women, changed it for children, changed it for the better all over the planet. And I'd be hard-pressed to say that there's nobody here on earth who hasn't at one time heard the name Jesus Christ. Well, what did Jesus do? Other than serve anybody and everybody that stood before him. He didn't write any masterpieces. He didn't paint any masterpieces. He didn't record any beautiful music or orchestras. He didn't do anything in terms of what the world calls, you know, magnificence. Now, he did do a few cool things like walking on water, but come on, would he really walk on water? He made a whole lot of bread, but you know, not anything earth moving. The only one thing he did do is he rose from the dead. D-E-A-D, -E he rose from the dead to prove that life is the goal, and that life eternal. Now, he did do that unlike any other religion, and that's what makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world. But other than that, you could say, well, that's great, but that doesn't really affect my life personally, does it? Well, you know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> Depends on how you see it. When he left, he gave us his spirit. Well, what if I don't want it? I do. <laughs> I don't care about you. What if I don't want it? What if it's That's in the your What if it's in the way? Well, then he ain't the greatest example, is he? You see what I'm saying? That's how submissive it can be. Paul is saying if you are a Christian, if you're going to be in the church, then you've got to be that good example. Just imagine if everybody in the church put themselves last and became the servant of everybody else in the church. Everybody trying to serve everybody. Would that be chaos or would that be cool? It would be cool. Well, how come we're not doing it? You know, 4% of the church bear probably 90% of the effort or work. And that's a fact in every church across the United States of America. You got 4% of the people who put it. You've got about 7% uh, supporting it financially. And the other 93%, you know, they're tipping. They throw a couple of bucks on the table every Sunday. And The government demands 18% minimum for income taxes, sometimes up to 28, sometimes up to 35 or whatever. 35% is what the government demands. God demands 10%, right? And yet we begrudge this. We pay the government. Why do we pay the government? Because we fear them. We fear they'll take our property away, right? We fear they'll throw us in jail. Tax evasion, we fear they big old Al Capone game down that way. We fear the government. Do we fear God? I would say most people in America do not. And I would include most Christians in that company. They don't fear God. And I don't mean to be afraid of God. I mean stand in awe of God, to respect Him. You know why we don't respect God in America? Because he's not our good example. Even though the Bible itself says there is no greater example of love and Jesus went to prove that. Even though that claim is made. Why doesn't America fear God? Well, because he's not their good example. Fear in the Bible, 90% of the time, is translated, if you look at the word, the etymology of the word, 
Uh, it's translated to stand in awe of or to be amazed by. Just like when I said, tell me five people in your life that you just are in awe of, that really moved you and are good examples. And then tell me why. You say, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. A, they've touched you personally, probably. B, they've helped you over a sustained period of time, not just one good deed 45 years ago. C, you have taken the time and invested yourself to get to know those people and what they've done over the years. So D, eventually you get to where even in your mind, whether it's conscious decision or not, you say, you know, that she is a really fabulous lady. Or he's a really great guy. But you see, that involves a lot of investment on your part in terms of getting to know someone, getting to study someone, getting to admire what, who they are, who they are to you, who they are to everybody else. And eventually you say, let me ask you a question. How many of you ever in here has met Mother Teresa? Anybody? And yet, if you lift that name up, most Christians would admire that name, right? Why? I've actually met her. I've actually met her. Is she a good example? I would say most definitely. Has she impacted my life? Indirectly. She's given me a good example to look at on a mission field. She's given me a good example of continuance to sustain a service over the years, even when it's hard and people don't want it or they're fussing or things are in trouble. But to, 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 to rally the troops, so to speak, and hang with the effort. Uh, is she individually impacting my life? Not really. But indirectly, she's given me a great example. To the point where even I would say, you're a heck of a woman. A lot better than some of these TV guys, right? Why? Well, because she lives what she preaches. In fact, she doesn't even preach. She just lives. And it's in that life example that we see the love of God, the character of God, that humble submission sustained to where the life itself is colored and fragranced by it. And pretty soon, let's face it, if someone always smells like vanilla, I used to date a girl that did that. She had a cologne that was vanilla. And every time I smelled vanilla to this day, I think of her. To this day, I think of her. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> However, there is a lot of impact there. All right, so this is the chapter. When it all comes down to it, Christianity, when the rubber hits the road, are you or are you not? Peter is following the same book as James that faith without evidence is dead. I've never seen an orange tree go out and self-promote itself, but I could tell you, I could show you and point to an orange tree 500 yards away just by looking at it. Why? Because it's that evident that there's an orange tree. Why isn't the Christian equally identifiable? Well, because maybe they're not living that example, or maybe that example is not that, that defined in their life. Why is it defined in their life? Well, because they really don't fear God. And I'm not talking about being afraid of, I'm talking about standing in awe of. Because if you stand in awe of somebody, you know them. You know how vital they are. You know, you, you know them as a good example of probably what you ought to be doing as well. And Jesus said there ain't no greater definition of love than, and he proved it. Okay, this is the end of Peter's chapter. Peter knew above everybody else what it means to be a lip service Christian. 
I mean, obviously, I'll follow you even unto death. And he didn't. He ran away. And he denied Christ three times before the very next morning. He didn't follow Jesus unto death. Well, eventually he did. But it took a lot of time before his character developed. And he put the big, mighty Peter aside and started taking on more of a role of servitude. God tells us quite plainly, as does Jesus, you won't do anything, even a little cup of cool water to someone, that goes unnoticed by the Lord. You won't do anything. Every time you guys set up those tables and chairs when nobody else wants to, God sees it. Every time you go and get this stuff when nobody else wants to, God sees it. Every time you do this when nobody else wants to, God sees it. Clean up that, fix up that, replace this, build that. Not making it different. There's a million things around the church to do. Oh, it's that easy. That easy to be a good example. It's equally easy to be a poor example. I would hope for each of you that someday when the question is asked, name five people that you admire, that those people would say, Tell me, Joseph. He's always been a great guy. Kukaracha. She's always been a good Kukaracha. Don't understand a word she says, but I love being her. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not making... Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be the most incredible comment you could, or, or, or platitude you could ever get? For someone else to say, he's my hero. Not some baseball guy in the 1975 Pirates team. Sister Teresa, I'll bet most of the world never knew her personally. And yet the entire world knew that name in a good light. In a good light. She wrote a book. Well, say it. I don't think it's her authorship that made her the good example. I think it was her life that made her a good example. As Malcolm Mugridge, the great blowhard, found out the hard way finally turned him around and said, oh, maybe I'm kind of a jerk. You think? <laughs> anyway, look at this example. That's Peter. Now, coming, considering who Peter was, he was the ultimate bad example. This book is huge for him. This letter is huge for him to come to the place in his life where he would not only write such a confession, but encourage others not to fall into the same trap with their faith. That's huge when you think about it. All right, that's all I got. Go away.